you, and I also want to thank uh, Evangeline. I was there 15 years ago in Houston, Texas, when this conference began uh, with just probably a quarter of the students that are in this room today, and it's wonderful to see how much it's grown and um, all of the work that Evangeline has done over the past 15 years, all the lives that you've touched. Um, you've really made a difference, and so I'm really thankful to be a small part of that difference. Um, so I, too, am going to tell a story, and um, the title of my story is The Ticket. I serve, as you've probably heard, as the dean at Washburn University School of Law. Um, it's truly an honor to serve as dean at an ABA-approved law school. I uh, am really thankful to be at Washburn because Washburn University was founded as Lincoln College after the Civil War to celebrate the end of slavery and to educate all people, including the recently freed slaves. And so while Washburn's not an HBCU because Kansas was a free state, it has a history of diversity and inclusion that I'm very proud of. And I'm very proud that when the law school was founded in 1903, um, it too had a mission of educating all people, including African Americans. And the law school, in fact, educated the three African American lawyers Charles Bledsoe, John Scott, uh, Charles, Charles Bledsoe, John Scott, and Charles Scott, all of whom um, together filed the complaint in federal district court in Brown versus Board of Education in Topeka, Kansas, to end racial segregation in public schools. And so I wouldn't be standing before you today if it wasn't for their work and the work of the lawyers in the other consolidated cases and the lawyers before the Supreme Court. So I'm really proud of that history. The school Lincoln College was renamed Washburn University because the school fell on hard times. Um, not everybody was in favor of having a school that educated blacks and whites together. Um, and so the school struggled financially and um, was on the brink of closure when a man named Ichabod Washburn came to the rescue. Mr. Washburn had been an abolitionist during slavery, and he believed in the right of all people to have education and self-determination. And so he made a financial contribution to Lincoln College that saved the school from going under. And so you can imagine they renamed the school after him. So it's a public school, even though it's named for its benefactor, Ichabod Washburn, with a public mission of educating people uh, regardless of race, creed, color, gender, or their um, financial ability to, to pay. Um, so it's an honor to be standing here before you today. I want to tell you a little bit about my story because there's nothing special about me. I uh, didn't anticipate that I would be standing here before you today as a law school dean. I was born to an unwed, unwed teen mother um, who was herself living in poverty. When the court asked her why she was giving me up for adoption, and I have the court papers, her response was, I have no way to care for her. So my relationship with my birth mom ended that day. And even though I was born as a full-term baby, I was less than four pounds at birth because my birth mom did not have enough food to eat during her pregnancy. As a result, I had to stay in the hospital for a period of time, and I was, as my dad would call it, a very sickly child. I was fortunate to be adopted by two loving African-American people, my mom, Johnny May, and my dad, Carl, who adored me. They also uh, brainwashed me into thinking that I was the smartest, cutest little thing on the planet. <laughs> we lived on a farm in rural Oklahoma, and they continually told me how smart I was, and they emphasized the importance of going to school and getting an education. 
Neither my mama nor my daddy had graduated from high school. And when my mom got breast cancer and eventually passed away when I was 12 years old, I learned a secret that I could not believe. My dad had been asking me to read letters that had been coming in the mail to him. And at 12, you know, you can be a little not nice. And so I was like, read it yourself. I'm tired of reading this stuff. Because his excuse was he didn't have his reading glasses. And so I went across the room, and I got his reading glasses, and I handed them to him. And I was like, read it yourself. And he quietly put the glasses down on the table, and he said, I can't. And I looked at him like he was crazy. I was like, yes, you can. Read it. And he said, I don't know how to read. In that moment, this man who had been Superman admitted to me that he could not read and write. It was something I could not believe because in my mind, my daddy could do everything. He was six foot four inches tall. He was my Superman, but reading was his kryptonite. I still couldn't believe it. I said, yes, you can read. I've seen you read. Because I had seen my dad sit and read the paper. And he said, be careful of the assumptions that you make. You've seen me looking at the newspaper because I wanted to create an environment where reading was something that you would do. I couldn't read the words on that paper. I was looking at the paper. But I've seen you drive a car. You know how to read because you can read the signs. He says, yeah, I know that red sign that says S-T-O-P means stop. But that's about the extent of my reading. My dad's disclosure of his secret to me was very hard for him. But he disclosed it because he wanted to share with me that his life had been very hard. He said, I want you to get an education because I don't want you to have a hard life. My dad was hired out by my grandfather to work for white families starting at the age of 10. So he wasn't allowed to go to school to learn to read and write. And when he finally became old enough to be on his own, he said he was too ashamed to go back to school and admit to people that he couldn't read and write. He said, I was too hard-headed to sit down and learn. You have the opportunity for learning, and you will have more opportunities in this life if you choose to learn. The choice is yours. You can either work hard and get through school and have a good life, or you can fail to get an education and have a hard life for your entire life. Education, he said, is the one thing no one can take from you. So I would heed my daddy's advice, and I would graduate from high school. And he had told me that I needed to go to college. But because we had to sell most of our farm to pay my mother's hospital bills for breast cancer, because in the 1970s, all cancer treatments were deemed experimental, and our health insurance didn't cover it, we plummeted from being a lower middle class family into the depths of poverty. When my dad drove us to the welfare office to sign up for food stamps, they said we didn't qualify because my dad owned our home outright. We had no mortgage on it, and so he had an asset. At 12 years old, I knew that was wrong. I said, so wait a minute, we have to become homeless before we can get some food? That makes no sense. But fortunately, my dad struggled, and he continued to encourage me, despite our financial woes, to attend college. 
how would I attend college when there's no money, I said. My dad had remembered that there was a black couple who had just gotten married, and his parents actually put them up in their home because they had no home. This couple had gone on to get their education, and they became academic leaders at a college in Texas. He reached out to them and he said, I have a daughter and I want her to go to college. They had me take a test, the ACT test. And I got a score that was apparently good enough for them to give me an academic scholarship. So this school that used to be East Texas Normal School, that at the time I attended was East Texas State University and is now Texas A&M at Commerce, is where I began my higher education. I was able to graduate from college, and as a senior, I knew I wanted to go to law school, but again, I had no money. I had read about a Supreme Court justice named Thurgood Marshall, the first African American to serve on the US Supreme Court. He graduated from Howard Law School because the University of Maryland would not accept him because of his race. So I thought, if Howard University School of Law was good enough for this Supreme Court justice, it was good enough for me. <laughs> and they might just invest in a little black girl from rural Oklahoma who wanted to be a lawyer. And maybe they'd give me a scholarship. So I applied, and I wrote in my personal statement that the only way I'd be able to come is if they gave me a scholarship. And so they did. Howard University School of Law took a chance on me. And the education that I received at Howard University School of Law transformed my life. It gave me, for the first time, power. Power over my own life. It prepared me to practice law. And it prepared me to become a law professor and a dean of a law school. My birth mom ended up marrying, and she had four additional children. As an adult, I was able to be reunited with her and my birth siblings. They all live in poverty, or just above the poverty line. Three of my siblings have served time in prison, despite being raised in a Christian home. All of my sisters were teen moms. I know that the Lord loves them like he loves me, so I asked myself, why? Why was I so blessed? How did I escape the snares of poverty? How did I get here? How did I get chosen to be the first African-American dean at Washburn University School of Law? As I reflect on that question, my only answer is that I was able to get the ticket. The ticket for a one-way trip out of poverty. For me, law school was that ticket. If I'm fired as dean at Washburn tomorrow, I have the knowledge and the skill to start my own business. I have the knowledge and the skill to start my own law practice. I am the captain of my ship now because Howard University School of Law invested in me and educated me. And my daddy was right. No one can take that from me. I hope every one of you sitting here today will get your own ticket and become the captain of your own ship. Thank you.